Welcome to Lifelong Learning at Roden Library. I'm Librarian Joyce Ellison here today with my colleague Renee House. We're also here today with veteran educator and quilter Annie McGriff and her granddaughter Abby Schmidt. Now Annie learned to piece quilts at her mother's knee, but it was from her dad that she honed her skills as a storyteller. Today, Aunt Annie wants her granddaughter, Abby, to hear about Deborah Hopkinson's story of Sweet Clara and the Freedom Quilt. And since Mrs. McGriff always goes above and beyond to illustrate a story, she has replicated the Freedom Quilt from that book um, so let's listen to what Annie wants Abby to learn about quilts, about Juneteenth, and about the Underground Railroad. Annie, we're so honored to have you here. Thank you, Miss Joyce. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to share a few facts about Juneteenth and tell you how quilts are alleged to have played a major role in the Underground Railroad. I think the best way to begin this presentation is with a few definitions. First of all, slavery. Slavery is the ownership of a person as property. The Underground Railroad. It is a network of secret routes, places, and people that help enslaved African Americans escape slavery in the South to freedom in the North or Canada. Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order issued by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. This order freed some 3.5 million African Americans but some states in rebellion refused to obey the directive. Juneteenth, the day June 19, 1865, gave rise to our present Juneteenth celebration. It was on this day, two and one half years after the emancipation, that enslaved people in the Galveston area of Texas finally learned of their freedom. Slave owners had to be forced to let the people go. On June 19, 2022, President Joe Biden, by executive order, declared Juneteenth a federal holiday in the United States. Today, Juneteenth is celebrated with parades, speeches, educational events, family gatherings, and picnics. It is a day to honor African-American culture, achievements, and history. It is a day for all races to come together in unity and fellowship. Now let's talk about the role quilts were said to have played in the slaves' quest for freedom. Many stories are told about symbols that were embedded in quilts. I have with me today three blocks that were allegedly used. This one is the flying yeast pattern. It told the slaves to follow the geese in the spring of the year because they always flew north at the beginning of that season. This one is the log cabin pattern. If a quilt with this symbol was seen on a fence or bush near a house, this was a safe house on the Underground Railroad where slaves were guided to freedom. And this one, the North Star.
the brightest star in the night sky that always pointed north. Slaves could use this star as a compass to keep them headed in the right direction. And now, I want to share a book with you. This book is entitled, Sweet Clara and the Freedom Quill. It is a fiction story that tells how one girl's bravery and determination helped her escape slavery and how she helped others gain their freedom. This is Sweet Clara's quilt, and this is her story in her own words. Before I was even 12 years old, I got sent from North Farm to Home Plantation because they needed another field hand. When I got back, I cried so much they thought I was never going to eat a drink again. I didn't want to leave my mom. I'm going back to her. I whispered every day to young Jack, who worked beside me in the fields. Well, you better start eating all you can, sweet Claire, he smiled at me. But then his smile was gone. In a low voice, he said, or else you won't make it. Young Jack helped me believe I'd get back to my mama someday. Truth was, I belonged before I got through the fields. Them men's big and all, but I didn't give up dreaming. Aunt Rachel was raising me now. She wasn't my for real blood aunt, but she did her best to care for me. One night she came back from working in the big house and find me lying dead tired on our cabin floor. She shook her head and said, Sweet Clara, you ain't gonna last in the fields, but I got an idea. Aunt Rachel's idea was sewing, and she started teaching me the very next night. It wasn't easy for me to learn. My hands already rough and clumsy from hoeing and weeding the fields. So Aunt Rachel took it real slow. She brought scraps of cloth from the big house and taught me about each one, how it was special and had to be treated with real care. I like to piece the scraps together to make pretty patterns and colors. But Aunt Rachel didn't care much about pretty patterns. Now you rip out that whole row and do it again, Clara, she say. Why well, I got to make the stitches so tiny, I complained. You gonna be a real seamstress, that's why. Tomorrow, you coming with me to the big house. I got it all worked out, Aunt Rachel said one day. I was right. You ready to sew with me, she went on. Mrs. Daughter Ellen be getting married come spring. I told Mrs. I'll be needing help. She look at your work with sharp eyes, Clara, so do it quick and neat like I taught you. This morning, I tried to eat some cornbread, but my insides were all knotted up. I never been inside the big house before or seen white people that close, except the overseer. The morning sun was streaming into the sun room, turning everything all sunflower yellow. Aunt Rachel gave me some sheets to him. Instead of being contrary, that needle did all I wanted, just like it was part of my hand. At the end of the day, Mrs. come in. Let me see your work, Clara, she said. I gave her the sheet, and she ran it through her hands real slow. I held my breath watching. From now on, come here, she said at last. When she left, Aunt Rachel and I looked at each other about ready to burst. We've done it, girl, she cried. So, I changed from a field hand to a seamstress. Since the sewing room was right off the kitchen, Aunt Rachel and I were near the cook and the helpers. There was always lots of bustle and company in the kitchen. I was hearing about all kinds of new places and things. I listened so hard, it felt like ears must be growing right out of my head and getting big with listening. One day, two white men come 
to see the master. The drowning went into the kitchen to talk to cook. There'll be too many runaways last summer, one of the drivers said. They're going around asking all the masters in the county to join the paddy rolls. Crazy running away, muttered cook, as she beat up some metal. Where you going? You gonna get lost in the swamp? Don't know, said the other, but I hear we ain't that far from the Ohio River. Once you get that far, the Underground Railroad will carry you across. That's right, agreed the first. The railroad will get you all the way to Canada. Then you free for help. Cook snorted. If it be as easy as you two let on, more would have gone. One of the men replied in a quiet voice. It be easy if you could get a map. Walking back from the big house that evening, I asked Aunt Rachel about what I heard. Where's Canada? And what's the Underground Railroad? See that? Aunt Rachel pointed. That's the North Star. Under that star, far up north is Canada. The Underground Railroad is people who've been helping folks get their secret money. She looked at me in awe. But don't you start thinking about it. You run away and get caught. You be beaten. Still, I couldn't stop thinking about it. Next day, I asked Cook, those two men that was here yesterday, they was talking about a map. What's a map? Just a picture of the land, that's all. Whatever's on the ground, a map can have it. Sunday, I went to my favorite place on the little hill and looked out at the people's cabins and fields. I took a stick and started making pictures in the dirt of all I could see. But how could I make a picture of things far away that I couldn't see? And how could I make a map that wouldn't be washed away by the rain? A map that would show the way to freedom. Then one day, I was sewing a patch on a pretty blue blanket. The patch looked just the same shape as the cow pond near the cabins. The little stitches looked like a path going all around it. Here it was. A picture that wouldn't wash away a map. So I started the quilt. When you sewing, no matter how, how careful you be, little scraps of foam always be left after you cut out a dress or a pillowcase. So while my ears kept listening and my hands kept sewing, I began to scroll away these bits of foam. When we was out of work, I went to visit people in the forest. I started asking what fields were where. Then I started piecing the scraps of cloth with the scraps of things I was learning. And Rachel said, Sweet Claire, what kind of pattern are you making in that quilt? Ain't no pattern I ever seen. I don't know, Aunt Rachel. I just patching it together as I go. She looked at me wrong, but she just nodded. There was a buzzing in the quarters one Sunday evening. I saw the pattern rolls and I knew someone had run away. It was young Jack, but five days later they caught him. That next Sunday I went to see him and we walked to the top of the little hill. He didn't smile the way he used to. I took a stick and began to draw in the dirt. I drew a little square of the big house, a line of boxes for the cabins of the quarters and some bigger squares for the field east of Big House. I drew as much as I pieced together. Jack sat beside me not saying anything, not even looking at first. Then he started seeing what I was doing. I handed the stick to him. I hear him catch his breath up quick. Then he began to draw. I worked on the quilt for a long time. Sometimes months would go by and I wouldn't get any pieces sewn in it. Sometimes I had to wait to get the right kind of form. I had blue calico and flower blue silk for creeks and rivers and greens and blue greens for the fields and white sheeting for roads. Mrs. liked to wear pink a lot, so big house, the quarters, and finally the 
big house had no form. They was all pink. The crib got bigger and bigger. If folks knew what I was doing, no one said it. But they came by the sewing room to pass the time of day, whatever they could. By the way, Clara, a driver might tell me, I heard the master saying yesterday, you didn't want to travel to Mr. Morris's place because it's over 20 miles north of here. Or someone would sit eating cooked food and say so as I could hear. Word is, they're going to plant corn in the three west fields on the Verona plantation this year. When the master went out hunting, Cook's husband was the guy. He come back and say, that swamp next to home plantation is a nasty place. But listen up, Claire, and I'll tell you how I thread my way in and out of there as smooth as your needle in that cloth. Then one night, the quilt was done. I looked at it spread out in the dim light of the cabin, and Rachel studied it for the longest time. She touched the stitches lightly, her fingers moving slowly over the last piece of our bed, a hidden boat that would carry us across the Ohio River. Finally, they came to rest on the bright star at the top. She tried to make her voice cheery. You always did like to make patterns and pictures, Clara. You get yourself married to young Jack one of these days, and you two will have a real nice quilt to sleep under. Aunt Rachel, I couldn't sleep under this quilt, I answered softly, putting my hands over hers. Wouldn't be restful somehow. Anyway, I think it should stay here. Maybe others can use it. Aunt Rachel sighed. But ain't you going to need to quit where you're going? I kissed her. Don't worry, Aunt Rachel. I got the memory of it in my head. It rained hard for three days for the next week. Me and Jack left home plantation in a dark thunderstorm. The day after, it was too stormy to work in the fields. So Jack wasn't missed. And Aunt Rachel told them I was sick. We went north following the trail of the Freedom Quill. All the things people told me about, all the tiny stitches I took. Now I could see real things. There was the old tree struck down by lightning, the winding road near the creek, the hunting path through the swamp. It was like being in a dream you were already dreaming. Mostly, we hid during the day and walked at night. When we got to North Farm, Jack slipped in through the darkness to find what cabin my mama had. Then we went in to get her and find a little sister I didn't even know I had. Mama was so surprised. Sweet Clara, you've grown so big. Her eyes, just like I remember, were on strong around me. Mama, I'm here for you. We're going north. We know the way. I was afraid they wouldn't come. But then Mama said, yes. Young Jack carried my sister Anna, and I held on to Mama's hand. We kept on as fast as we could, skirting farms and towns, and making our way through the woods. At last, one clear, dark night, we come to the Ohio River. The river was high, but I remember the place on the quilt where I marked the crossing. We searched the brush along the banks, until at last we found the little boat. This was hid here by the folks in the Underground Railroad, I said. The boat carried us across the dark, deep water to the other side. Shivering and hungry and scared, we stood looking ahead. Which way now? Jack asked me. I pointed. The North Star was shining clear above us. Up there through the woods, north to Canada. Sometimes I think back to the night we left when young Jack came to wake me. I can still see Aunt Rachel sitting up in her bed. She just shook her head before I could say a word. Before you go, just cover me with your quilt, sweet Clara, she said. I'm too old to walk, but not too old to dream. 
and maybe I can help others while we're equipped to freedom. And Rachel kept her word. The quilt is there still at home plantation. People go look at it, even folk from neighboring homes. I know because some of them come and tell me how they used it to get free, but not all are as lucky as we were and most never can come. Sometimes I wish I could so quilt that was spread over the whole land and the people just follow the stitches to freedom as easy as taking a Sunday walk. Now you know the story of the Freedom Quilt. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience and happy Juneteenth, everybody. <laughs>